You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. I think if we're really going to take a step out there and, and assume a role in our communities, public outreach is, is the key to doing this. Uh, I think we're very fortunate in the federal system that, that we have many resources that are unavailable to, to some of the local agencies in the community. And I think we have a responsibility to, to play a role, to take the lead uh, in reaching out to the community, reaching out to some of our fellow criminal justice agencies, uh, engaging in partnerships with them. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and I think a lot of people uh, formulate their opinions about criminal justice and community corrections about what they see and hear on, on TV. And many times that's a distortion of what we really do. In the nature of our work, which is working with defendants and offenders, we need to be resource brokers. That means we need to connect with other people and agencies in the community. So we need to do outreach so we can be more effective in making connections. I believe that public outreach is important to the system because it's a way for us to get feedback um, from our constituents, from the public, about their expectations of, of, of us and how we're doing our work and what they want us to be doing. In our involvement uh, in community services, we um, open up avenues uh, for uh, development of, of additional resources that we may not know that are available, which help us in the supervision uh, efforts. Day in, day out, uh, my officers are changing lives, uh, and nobody knows about it. And so it's important, I think, uh, that we let people know uh, what uh, positive things are going on. The Federal Judicial Center, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, presents Public Information and Outreach, Probation and Pretrial Services. And now your moderator for today's program, Bob Fagan. Welcome to today's broadcast on Public Information and Outreach. Probation and Pretrial Services are increasingly engaged in community service programs that educate the criminal justice family, service providers, and the general public about its functions. This leads to a better understanding of the impact probation and pretrial services have on public safety and aids in developing trust with the community. Today, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, we're going to take a look at some of the key issues and challenges probation and pretrial services face when performing information and outreach activities. Through discussions with panelists both here in the studio and at our field sites, we'll learn about effective practices that individual districts develop to meet those challenges. The districts participating will tell us what works for them. These same practices may or may not be effective for you. That's for you and perhaps your judge to decide. As we saw in the opening, the challenges are numerous. We have quite a bit to talk about. Our hope is that by the end of it, you will have a working definition of public information and community outreach as it applies to probation and pretrial services, understand the role of the district in cultivating the mutually dependent relationship with the criminal justice family, service providers, and the general public, and finally, to become familiar with effective programs that help promote better understanding among the criminal justice family service providers, and the general public. At our website, we have materials that include many references and websites, plus a roster and program evaluation. Now on to today's agenda. To help define public information and outreach, we're going to start with an interview with David Sellers, AO Assistant Director for the Office of Public Affairs. This will be followed by our Getting the Word Out panel discussions. We'll cover community programs that districts have sponsored alone with other criminal justice agencies or service providers and the public. After that, our community outreach panel discussion will focus on crime prevention initiatives and efforts of districts in reaching out to service providers and schools. Next, our panel will discuss the challenges and benefits of investing resources in community outreach program. 
Finally, we'll hear from John Hughes, AO Assistant Director for the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services. We'll then have a short wrap-up at the end. As mentioned before, probation and pretrial services are increasingly engaged in community outreach programs that educate the criminal justice family, service providers, and the general public about its functions, leading to a better understanding of its impact on public safety. We'll cover a small sample of community programs that districts have sponsored alone with other criminal justice agencies or service providers to provide increased services to the community. Before we get into our panel discussion, we're using the following model to explain to you what we mean when we say community outreach. Probation and pretrial services interact with a variety of different communities. The first community, and the one closest to us in doing our job, is the criminal justice family. This consists of judges, attorneys, law enforcement agencies such as FBI, DEA, INS agents, marshals, and BOP. It also includes local law enforcement authorities. Service providers make up the second community group. These would consist of sex offender and substance abuse facilities and counselors, halfway houses, treatment centers, employers, and alternative schools. The third community, and perhaps the most important, is the general public. This would include Congress, schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, neighborhood groups, and of course, the taxpayer. It's important that we get the word out about what probation and pretrial services do that contribute to keeping the public safe. And this can be done in a variety of ways. Providing education about probation and pretrial services roles and functions for new attorneys and judges can smooth the way to a more cooperative working relationship. Aligning our districts with treatment providers to establish a network of services may open up needed resources. Educating students about the consequences to breaking a federal law helps in crime prevention. Officers tutoring students provide an opportunity to establish a meaningful relationship between students at risk and a good adult role model. Investing in community outreach activities is always a worthwhile endeavor. As the three community groups begin to realize how the work of probation and pretrial services supports their needs, the investment we make will all come back to us. It will come back to us not only by feeling that we've done something worthwhile, but also in the form of new partnerships established where none had existed. It will allow for better cooperation among the various criminal justice family members. And more importantly, the general public will see that probation and pretrial services are not invisible government agencies using up taxpayers' money, but rather active criminal justice agencies helping to keep the public safe. And now, to introduce us to the field of public information and outreach, my colleague David Leathery sat down with David Sellers, AO Assistant Director for the Office of Public Affairs, to discuss basic definitions and concepts regarding public information and community outreach for probation and pretrial services. David, thank you for joining us during this telecast. Let's start by with the question of a working definition of public information and outreach and what that means in relation to the judiciary. Sure. Outreach of the federal judiciary is really very different than the term in the state judiciary or even the term in the executive or legislative branch. Uh, it is a somewhat conservative uh, educational approach to sharing information, to building relationships, to taking those relationships that are in place and expanding them, and to heighten, heightening visibility. And in the federal judicial environment, that's something that's a relatively new concept, but I think the time has come and that uh, judges, clerks of court, probation officers, uh, really all members of the federal court family are starting to embrace this effort. And from your perspective, why do you feel it's so important to the judiciary? Well, I think there's a common perception, and I, I happen to agree with this, that you can't support or can't trust something that you don't understand. And I think there is a great amount of misunderstanding or misconceptions about the federal courts. 
and I'd have to say that that applies even more so to the probation and pretrial services uh, portion of the federal judiciary. As you know, about 25 percent of all people who work in the courts work in this area, but I think there's a lack of knowledge not only within the courts themselves, but certainly within the community, within the news media, within our legislatures about uh, what these people do. And how does your office support support this function, this initiative? Uh, of the 30,000 people in the federal courts, I'm sorry to say there's only one who has the title Community and Educational Outreach Manager, and that person is Rebecca Fanning, who's located in the Office of Public Affairs. Uh, so she is a very energetic, dynamic person who is committed to working with uh, anyone in the court family who is interested in outreach. I know she's worked uh, extremely closely with the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services at the AO. And I think Rebecca and uh, Nancy Beatty and John Hughes and others who are committed to this uh, will take a phone call, will take an email, will talk about uh, outreach. And Rebecca has a history in this area. As I say, it's a relatively new one, but she knows the successes working with judges, working with clerks of court. And I think all you need are a few successes and it, you can build from there. And what are the benefits you see from a proactive outreach program? It's difficult to take any measurements in this area to see anything that's concrete. However, there have been surveys that have been done. There was one in 1999 by the Hearst Corporation that said the more people understand about their courts, the better they feel about them, the more they support them. Uh, one of our goals is to try to get uh, students who will soon be jurors to uh, appear when they get their jury summons. So a lot of our effort is focused on exposing high school students to the federal court process. Uh, so they understand their responsibilities, not only as jurors, but now that probation and pretrial services is part of this effort, that they can understand the consequences of committing a crime. So I think that the, the payoffs, while they may be difficult to find in specific situations, uh, are, are certainly there, and I think we'll begin to see them more. And, and what advice might you have for districts who are looking to undertake a, a public outreach initiative? Uh, as I said earlier, I know this is a relatively new effort within the federal courts. I also know that every single court is very busy. So I think they need, they need a focus on what they can and what they can't do. To identify a particular program, uh, FedFacts, which is a new CD that has been made available to each office, each probation and pretrial service office around the country, is a prepackaged uh, a way of teaching about this, and that might be a good way for some offices to get into this. Uh, others may choose to invite school students in. Um, we have a national program we're promoting in my office called Open Doors of Justice. FedFax is part of that program, and part of that is to have high school students visit courthouses around the country and get to meet uh, not only judges, clerks of court, but also probation and pretrial services officers. So if courts can pick one or two initiatives a year, try to focus, uh, try to share ideas with other courts so we're not all reinventing the wheel. Uh, I think that's a good way to get started. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us during this telecast. Thank you very much. Now armed with that background in public information and outreach, we'll head into our first panel discussion, getting the word out with the criminal justice family. Joining me in the studio is Elaine Terenzi, Chief Probation Officer of the Middle District of Florida, who has a lot of experience with community outreach programs. George Walker, Chief Pretrial Services Officer, the Central District of California, who has recently created a community information and coordination program specialist position in his district. And Joe Giacobbe, Chief Probation Officer of the Western District of New York, is a recent recipient of the AO's Director's Award and is also very much involved in public information and community outreach programs in his district. George, I want to turn to you first. Uh, you heard what David Sellers had to say about the importance of public information and outreach programs. Uh, what else would you add to David's comments? Well, Bob, I think it's important to underscore the fact that probation and especially pretrial services uh, can have a lot of uh, misconception out in the community. And a good program, a good public information program, can help us build important relationships both with our court community and with the community as a whole. So anytime we get an opportunity to put our best foot forward and to get out to the community and show them who we are, what we do, and what our successes are, 
it's, it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us. And we're going to talk a lot about the different kinds of relationships. That's really one of the main points of, of this particular program. Joe, I understand that at the Chiefs Conference held uh, this past August, the Chiefs indicated that uh, there was a need to work more with the community. Tell us more about that. Well, Bob, it was actually at the last two Chief National uh, Workshops, we held a series of future search conferences. And uh, the chiefs participated in these conferences and developed and identified some goals and aims that we wanted to work toward. Then we had an interactive voting uh, process at the uh, f first at the end of each day of our workshop, and uh, we came to a common ground and identified some important factors. Um, a consistent theme rose, and that theme was that there was a need for us to get out into the community and supervise and take advantage of the resources available in the communi community, so to speak, get out from behind the desk mm -hmm. and become active in the community to build relationships. So the Chiefs saw it as really a kind of a high priority area. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, what do you think some of the challenges are that districts might expect when they go about the process of uh, implementing a public information type uh, program, an outreach program? Well, I think that the first challenge is, is just to overcome our own reticence. Uh, generally, when we step out into the public arena, um, into the media, it's often not good. It's be in response to something that's happened because one of our offenders has done something or something has happened on supervision. Um, so I think that overcoming our reticence and being willing to take the risk is the first. I also think that, it, that it's challenging to find the right opportunities. So find the opportunities for meaningful outreach because it's not just outreach. It's outreach for a purpose. Um, and then I think that the the other great challenge is balancing our core responsibilities with a sustainable outreach program. Yeah, those are those are challenges, and in fact, a lot of choices to be made. I'm going to talk also about some of those choices since we'll hear a lot about uh, various programs. Um, let's take this opportunity to hear from a chief about one of the district's community outreach programs. We found over over time that there's a. Uh, a significant degree of understanding difference about what what it is we do what our role and responsibility is and specifically as they relate to law enforcement agencies at the state local and federal level I would say the program that uh, I would re want to talk a little bit about is our exchange training exchange information with the uh, New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Academy that's the Academy that trains all law enforcement personnel for the state of New Hampshire and uh, we have a couple people on our staff who have been trained as instructors over there in a number of different law enforcement sub subjects. And when the academy needs instructors, uh, they'll often call us to see if we have our people available to help them out. And in return, we get the resources and the, and the expertise of all of their trainers in uh, many, many different subjects across the board as far as uh, law enforcement related type training. So it's been, a, it's been, it's accomplished two things. It's exposed us to uh, a lot of good training free of charge and I think it's helped us to understand and helped, helped us to convey our message to the uh, actual students in the class where we have our trainers about what it is we do in the federal system and what our role and responsibility is. That's really an excellent example of what a district is doing in getting the word out to the criminal justice family. Uh, Joe, I want to turn to you first. What are some other ways that districts can communicate to the criminal justice family about the role of probation and pretrial services? Well, Bob, we seem to have an easier time relating to law enforcement officers and agencies because we have a lot of things in common with them, uh, crime prevention, crime detection, what the hot drugs are in the street and what the hot uh, unique weapons are uh, in the streets. Uh, we have a mutual assistance group where we uh, officers in our district meet with law enforcement community on a regular basis and collaborate and share information. Uh, we have a cyber crime task force, uh, career criminal task force groups developed by the Department of Justice. Uh, a new program which was a spin-off from Project Exile uh, is called SACSI, or it, and it stands for uh, Strategic Approaches to Community Safety Initiatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, officers assigned to this group, and this group is made up of uh, law enforcement, uh, clergy representatives, uh, family, uh, victims of family, I should say, um, prosecutors, mental health, correction types. And uh, they go to the community and meet with high-risk uh, young adults and, and tell them uh, what they're in for in the event they get uh, involved in criminal activities, mainly using weapons, mm -hmm. and, and we try to reach them in, in that manner. So this is an effort to, to reach out uh, in a collaborative style, again, uh, 
uh, in mass and, and with, with a lot of help and, and with part of the law enforcement community. Yeah, and it's also an excellent opportunity um, to communicate roles and responsibilities so everybody Absolutely. has a real that's, clear that's view of what those roles and responsibilities are. True. George, why do you think the criminal justice family is such an important uh, community group to focus on when we think of uh, implementing public information outreach programs? Well, Bob, I think it's, it's vital because good communication starts in the home, I think, and our home in this case is the court family and the court family is a diverse family and we should work very hard to continually get our message out to our judges, to the U.S. attorneys, to the uh, public defender, to the agents, you know, just what it is that we do, what we can do, what we can't do, and where we're effective and where we're successful and also especially I think where our challenges are. And I don't know that we always do such a great job of that, but in recognizing that that's where we need to start, we do a good job and that it prepares us for getting out into the general community mm -hmm. and spreading our message. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Elaine, I know you have a, a wonderful example of partnering with a criminal justice agency and uh, to produce a CD that I understand is used to educate students about the legal consequences of being found guilty of drug prevention. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later, but uh, for now, if you can give us some other examples or a different examples of getting the word out to the criminal justice family. Well, I think that we can do this is find the opportunities as a natural extension of our work um, and look for those that are not comfortable. For example, the criminal justice community, the agents, the U.S. Attorney's Office, we're, we're often very comfortable mm -hmm. with that particular group. Um, but let's look at some of the groups that maybe we're not as comfortable with, that perhaps we're put in a different role with. The Federal Public Defender is one that, that uh, uh, was mentioned that I think is very important. Uh, that may take a little bit more effort on our parts to reach out to, um, but it's very, very valuable. And we can do that both formally by training together with them, by inviting them to our training forums as well, maybe using the FJTN. Maybe they're ones that they might be interested in sitting in on. Um, and also informally by making a discipline of calling them um, and inquiring, not only do you want to be in on the interview, but inquiring about are there any departure issues that you're aware of that you, uh, you might want us to investigate or look into. So I think that reaching out is very important. We also had a, a, um, a wonderful opportunity in our district. We um, are part of, we have officers who are part of the Coleman um, Community Board. And one of our supervisors established a program for the case managers from the BOP at Coleman to ride along with our officers during pre-releases. What a wonderful way for them to see our frustrations in, in trying to plan for an, for an offender who may have an inadequate plan. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities available if we just look at the natural extension of our work. Yeah, once again, great opportunities to communicate. And in addition to that, especially with folks riding, riding along, it's just a good idea. They get to see the bigger picture, yes, I think which I think is so, it's so valuable. Yeah. Well, thank you, Elaine. And, and now we'll move to uh, our, our next topic. We just discussed the importance of getting the word out to the criminal justice family. Now we're going to focus on getting the word out to the service providers. On the Indian reservations, uh, we have a number of sex offenders, unfortunately. Um, two of our officers in the Tucson office decided that they wanted to do something about some of the victims of sexual abuse that are children. And so they brought together folks from both the federal authorities and the Indian nation uh, to work together toward uh, working with sex offenders and their victims. They brought together tribal judges, federal judges, treatment providers on the reservation, uh, victims, um, counselors, anyone that they felt could help. And they developed an alliance and they called themselves the Effective uh, Sex Offender Treatment Group. I think this is an important program because this is a program that was started by two federal probation officers, but will continue to provide services in the future to victims and to offenders and their families. I started researching through the internet, finding out what had happened in different districts regarding education and employment. And really, there hasn't been a whole lot that happened for offenders. And then 
people had mentioned that job fairs occurred inside prisons, and we, I started thinking, why not do one outside of prison? That thought led to Cleveland's extremely successful Community Corrections Job Fair, the first of its kind in the country, an event so successful that it can serve as a model for joint projects between federal courts and local community agencies. So then we, um, I started thinking, well, you know, Cuyahoga Work and Training, which is a county agency, they're the ones that are experts at this. They've been getting people off welfare and putting them to work. We really need to get them on board. These are the people that know the employers. I'm not in a, I know some employers that will hire offenders, but they're the people that know the employers and can tell us how we can get employers to it. They paid for the um, convention center. Because there's 17,000 people on supervision, we needed to use our convention center. It was one of the few facilities that were big enough to, to hold the event. We had our local newspapers were there, as well as I mean, all our little community newspapers were there in addition to every TV station that covers the events in Cleveland was there, as well as USA Today put an article about it. And it just, it just hit the media once they found out how many people were there, which uh, just raised all the awareness on the issue, which was part of our point, get people jobs and raise the awareness. Ohio has found this job fair initiative to be so successful that they have held a second job fair with over 4,800 participants and I understand are planning a third job fair. George, we heard a little bit about getting the media involved. Uh, uh, why do you think it's so important to get media coverage for some of our public uh, information outreach programs? Well, Bob, it's, it's very important to use the media whenever you can. However, that can be kind of a scary kind of thing because you're never quite sure how it's, it's going to come out. Uh, however, it's the quickest way to get the word out. Uh, if you can establish a, a rapport with the media, if you've got a really good program going and you can garner the interest, then the media is the way to go. As you say, it can be somewhat chancy, especially if there's a, a misquote. So that's exactly it. And and they will, you know, take information and sometimes, you know, divvy it out the way that they want to. But uh, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Yeah. We should put our best foot forward, as I've said. The idea is to get get the word out, so in fact uh, you can control the uh, the, the word if uh, if Hopefully, possible. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, Elaine, we just heard two very different examples, if you will, and what's the value of these different kinds of approaches to public information and outreach? Well, if you, we look at our offender population, our defendant population, they're very diverse, especially within our system, within the federal system. The diversity of the kind of offenders that come to us and uh, the diversity of their needs uh, is just tremendous. I, I, so. When we were, in fact, when we were at the Chiefs Conference this year um, and we started to design the Charter for Excellence, one of the things that we looked at is what makes our profession so unique? And I think that that's it, is, is the, our officers' ability uh, to do so many different things. And we do so many different things. Mm -hmm. I love Julian Dew's comment at the beginning, you know, every day we are changing people's lives and we do it quietly and people don't generally see that. But because of the diversity of the needs of our population, um, sometimes we just can't do it all. Sometimes we don't have the money to broker it all, and we really do need to reach out to other agencies um, to partner with them in order to meet all of these diverse needs. There's also so many agencies out there whose mission um, really complements our own, and that it, we have a mutual mission. And if we can capitalize on that, we can just get more accomplished um, and really be more effective. So I think that, that there's two issues here. One is why do the outreach? because we need to, and the other is why take the chance of having it publicized? And I think that's because people don't know, like Julian said, we do good things every day, but people don't see that. And if we can change that perception, I think that has a value as well. Now this partnership with, with uh, service providers is so important. As you say, it's such a diverse population that we're dealing with, and the service providers are so diverse, each with, uh, if you will, their, their gifts. So it's really uh, important to uh, to make that connection and get that partnership going. At the community board meeting, for example, we met with the U.S. attorney from um, who was representing Weed and Seed, and we didn't realize that the Weed and Seed program had grant money in many of the communities where we had our greatest needs. I mean, a, a perfect opportunity for partnership, uh, and we only found that out through the community board meeting. Yeah, that's that's the real the real value of it. Uh, Joe, would you like to add something? Yeah, I would. Bob, I want to bring in the staff's perspective uh, because we, it's the staff that are going to drive these programs, obviously, and we have to generate interest. Uh, and, and we're lucky in that 
our staff, uh, they become interested on their own more often than not. So I asked them why a couple of the people involved in the employment program, why did you get involved in this program? And they said, well, we wanted to make a difference. And then one of my uh, relatively new employees said, you know, it wasn't too long ago when I was unemployed, and I want to be able to give something back uh, because I know what that person's going through. I thought that was uh, interesting. You know, and, and the bottom line is by getting in people involved in the employment, uh, job rating this program, or getting them jobs or educational programs, you know, we're meeting our mission to uh, uh, make productive citizens out of the individuals under our supervision. You know, get them working and hopefully they'll stay crime free and drug free. So, uh, again, make a difference was one of the themes that came through from the Chiefs National Conference. So, uh, we, here we have staff thinking along those lines along the same lines that our chiefs are thinking across the country. I just think that's important to note. Yeah, I think it is. And again, it goes back to Julian Dew's statement. It just makes, it's it makes, wonderful. it's a wonderful statement. It makes mm -hmm. staff feel good about uh, what they're doing. Absolutely, that's true. Uh, you heard Magdalene Jensen describe the Effective Sex Offender Treatment Group. We have on the phone with us one of the officers who worked on this program, Jennifer Sunshine, who's currently a supervising probation officer in Tucson. Uh, Jennifer, please tell us a little more about how you got started in the program and what benefits you see. Well, Bob, Adria Santa Ana and I recognize the devastation caused by sexual violence throughout the Indian communities in southern Arizona. So we created ESOM. Uh, ESOM members are tribal members and uh, federal professionals who work with sexual victims and offenders. We had no funding, but we set out to design culturally appropriate strategies for sex offender notification, community education, and treatment of perpetrators, victims, and the families of both. Uh, we, our tribal leadership conference provided training, and the attending tribal leaders created action plans for ESOM's future efforts. We also provided line training for the staff out on the reservations. We held community meetings to win support for sex offender notification and changed tribal law to permit this through an open election. We've obtained grants and hired a research assistant. One benefit has been an increased reporting of sex crimes to tribal law enforcement. It seems the community um, now has a new trust in the federal system ability to appropriately manage and treat sex offenders. Uh, Maggie Jensen supported this unusual program, has illustrated that innovative projects are valued here. I believe this will encourage other community programs designed by other federal probation officers. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, why do you think service providers would be interested in partnering with probation and pretrial services to provide a community outreach program such as the one uh, in Arizona or in Ohio Northern? Elaine, let me ask you that. Well, as I said earlier, our missions really, we do have mutual missions. Um, we are not the only people invested in offender success. I think there are a lot of community agencies, domestic violence agencies, that are trying very hard um, to break the cycle. There are education agencies, uh, English as second language agencies. There are so many whose missions really fit well within our own and they're they, uh, willing and able to work with us uh, to meet our mission, mm -hmm. uh, which is also to help offenders succeed and do well in the, in the community and not reoffend. All right, George, can you share with us how some pretrial services officers have implemented community outreach programs uh, with service providers? Well, there are a variety out there, and, and I think, you know, pretrial services starts out a little bit on the short end. I think if you say probation to somebody, they'll have some idea of what probation is, or at least what it's about. You say pretrial to them, and most of the time they have no idea what pretrial services is. And I think the community would be very surprised to find out that, that during the pretrial stage that uh, defendants under supervision are receiving services, that we're brokering services to them, that our officers are out there meeting with case managers, that they're trying to hook up defendants with, with employment services. And who could ever imagine that an employer would want to hire somebody who might be going off to federal prison in six months or a year? But they're out there. And so we have successes like that all the time. So many of the pretrial services agencies throughout the nation, from what I've seen, 
have a lot of programs going on interfacing with the community, and we can do a lot more. Great. Joe, how does working with service providers help in achieving the overall mission of uh, probation and pretrial services? Bob, we're more than a tail em, nail em, and jail em organization. <laughs> um, this is an opportunity, as Elaine has indicated, for us to, to uh, exercise our mission and reach our goals. And, and by developing employment programs, for example, we are uh, uh, building relationships with the offenders, defendants, and pretrial uh, uh, defendants and, and, and getting them to be uh, to a level where they're contributing to their family support or fine and restitution or co-pay. Uh, and on the other side, the officers are feeling enrichment from their jobs by uh, getting involved in programs and, and they're exercising some of their leadership skills and, and by uh, making decisions and, and having exercising autonomy by getting involved in these uh, programs and uh, uh, getting recognition from their involvement and that's important from an officer's perspective so it's twofold it's benefiting the officer as well as the people we're supervising I think that's something we really want to to emphasize I mean we keep on going back to Julian Dew's uh, statement but it is such an important uh, uh, fact that they feel good about what they're doing and the public tends to see them also in another light if you will, an alternative light uh, that is not just the nail em, jail em kind of thing, right. but also as some folks who are really interested in, 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 in helping. In the long run, we have more success cases than we do failures, and that's something we really have to focus on. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, now let's move to our next topic. Let's move on to the third community highlighted on the model, the public. As you recall, the public would include Congress, schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, neighborhood groups, and of course, taxpayers. Most folks have not heard of pretrial services. They don't know what it's about. Uh, many folks think that it's part of the uh, Justice Department, as they do many of the uh, uh, court units. Uh, they all think we are uh, not the third branch of the government, but rather are part of the um, uh, United States Attorney's Office or Justice Department in general. We just started an online job application um, um, program th on our uh, internet site. And an employee or a potential employee can go to our internet site and all of the vacancy announcements are located on the site. Uh, a potential candidate can read the announcement and if interested and qualified fill out the application online and then transmit it electronically and uh, that information is used by us then for uh, ranking and screening purposes but that whole process uh, in just researching the job announcements uh, also links the potential candidate to uh, information about pretrial services specifically and the federal court generally. So it's a good um, way of conveying and disseminating information about the federal judicial system and specifically the United States Pretrial Services Office. Most districts have set up websites for both internal and external use. Uh, how effective is it to set up websites on the internet uh, to be used both internet and the web uh, by the general public? Uh, Elaine, let me ask you that question. Well, I think that, th that all we have to do is look at our own habits to realize how, how incredibly effective the Internet is as a means of getting information out. I mean, it's, it is often our first source for information. Um, and we, we, like most of the other districts in the country, have a, a very um, rich intranet site. And we've always been a little bit hesitant to go out on the Internet too much because it is so immediately available and if you need to be concerned about that. Um, but we're going to take the plunge. And right now we have a committee, a really exciting committee, they're doing such tremendous work, a committee working on putting together a real public internet site for our, for, for our uh, defendants, offenders, and their families. Um, as well as the general public, and they have uh, they started by writing a questionnaire that went out to, to offenders to find out would you use this tool? If you use this tool, what kinds of things are you interested in? What services would you be interested in? Um, 
what kind of information can we pull together from other sources for you to, to, to uh, help make you more successful in supervision. Um, and that's what we started with. And then the committee got together and they have now drawn out what we call our storyboards of how the internet site is going to look. And we've added uh, frequently asked questions and a place for people from the public to ask questions to us, uh, information about the pre-sentence phase and what a family sh can expect from the investigation, that investigation, and how they can help in the investigation, um, as well as a tipster se section so that, that people can provide anonymously information I if they choose to. So That's we're going to try and pull this all together yeah. and look at our mm -hmm. site in about three months because now, now <laughs> we're getting ready for it. And it'll be at uh, www.usprobation.com or .net. And so we're ready to go. So we're, we're really excited to about it. Okay. About that. <laughs> we'll be back I think so, you. Gary. Are you listening? <laughs> um, I hope that, 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 that that'll be, be done. But the work that they've done so far is just amazing. Well, there's so much information now that's coming over the Internet uh, that, um, in fact, we mentioned uh, before that uh, we have included as part of the downloadable materials uh, uh, some websites that uh, you can take a look at uh, as uh, for examples of, of what various districts uh, are doing to uh, to get the word out. Uh, it's more gen than just vacancy announcements. There are mission statements, various uh, statements for the public. Uh, just to give them a general explanation, if you will, about probation and pretrial services. And one of the districts, I believe it's Virginia Eastern, uh, also has a, a translation function. Uh, in recognition of the diverse population that it deals with, you can get on there and you can translate anything on there to, to, the, to the language that's, that's, that's appropriate for you. So that's, that's, these examples are out there. Uh, but, but that's not the only way to communicate with the well, public. That's true. So, Joe, let, let me, me tell uh, you my story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had six individuals a few months ago arrested uh, from our Muslim community and charged with uh, acts of terrorism against the United States. And this became a uh, sensational case, uh, newsworthy nationally, internationally. Uh, we had uh, the arraignment and three days of detention hearings and uh, uh, gained a lot of public interest. And uh, part of the uh, uh, group that was showing up on a regular basis were supporters of these six defendants, family members and friends from a very large Muslim community that we have in our neighborhood. And um, we really don't know much about the Muslim religion. And uh, so at, certain, at a certain point of the detention hearing, we felt that there may be a possibility that one or more of the defendants would be released on bail. So in order to possibly gain some assistance in the supervision process, um, as Elaine indicated, we took the initiative to reach out to the president of the Muslim Society he was very receptive to us, and we arranged to have a, a meeting in their society hall uh, one evening. So I brought 15 of my uh, staff, and uh, we had 30 of their uh, community leaders and members of the uh, six uh, defendants, members of their family were also present, and we provided an orientation, just telling them what our roles and responsibilities and our parameters are uh, as it relates to pretrial, pre-sentence investigation, and post-sentence supervision. And, and I think we reduce some of the fear uh, that, that they had of law enforcement in general following this experience in their neighborhood. And uh, we, had, we were met with open arms, and uh, they were a very friendly group. Uh, we gave the orientation for an hour, and then we listened to a, a one-hour PowerPoint presentation from the president of the society on the Islamic culture and Muslim religion. So it was a learning experience for both of us. Again, we built uh, relationships, we open up doors, and uh, we, f we feel that we will be able to uh, effectively supervise the individuals if and when released. Yeah. Know, eventually they will be released, they're not going to be locked up forever. Yeah. What a great opportunity though for both, uh, both to learn and to get the word out. It, it's it just really a wonderful was. opportunity. It was. Yeah. Uh, George, what other ways can probation and pretrial services reach out to the public? Well, I think it's important to note that there are ways available to, to agencies who just want to start out. I, I refer to uh, a couple of different ways, passive and active. The active approach is to get out into the community and, and kind of spread the word and, and uh, do the variety of things that we've talked about already. The passive way is to actually produce materials uh, such as brochures and newsletters. And, and uh, we do a lot of things uh, back in our district in-house, and we also do some things that are for out-of-house uh, mm -hmm. to get out to the community. A, bro a local brochure on our agency, a local brochure on our uh, electronic monitoring program. 
so we've started started out kind of in that way, and then hopefully one of these days we'll get our staff uh, involved and we'll we'll take the uh, active approach to getting mm -hmm. out into the community. That's no, you're not exactly describing a, a passive approach. <laughs> that's, that's, that's still it's getting information out to the community, it which is. is which is is active. Uh, Elaine, do you have anything to add? Well, <clears throat> when Joe was talking, it reminded me of, of a situation we had had in New York uh, during the early days of electronic monitoring. Um, we had gotten quite a few challenges uh, about wearing the electronic monitoring equipment over the weekend from the Hasidic, uh, which is a very religious Jewish community in, uh, in Brooklyn, and on religious grounds that uh, they couldn't wear the electronic equipment, nor could they answer the telephone during that time. And what we did was we met with uh, an offender, his rabbi, established a meeting with the Rebbe of the community. And we were able to bring the equipment there and show the equipment, explain how it worked, um, and what the benefits were for the community to have the, this uh, equipment available to them to, to help keep the offender in the community, to continue to support their family, which is very strongly uh, valued uh, within that community. And uh, the Rebbe uh, uh, reduced the resistance for us. Uh, for using the equipment, and the challenges really uh, did go down. So that was very helpful, and it kind of reminded me of, of taking that step out uh, that Joe had mentioned. Also, um, we had talked about the CD a little bit, and the, the organization with whom we partnered to create that was the Regional Community Policing Institute. It's part of the COPS program that's funded through Congress. And um, they are all over the country. Mm -hmm. They do training all over the country with local law enforcement. They do joint training for lots of variety of different agencies. They also train, to provide training opportunities for the general public on community policing, but also on some other hot topics. One new area that they're, they're doing right now is terrorism. So they have like this hour and a half s small prepackaged training that they're trying to get out to community groups on terrorism, and they're looking for trainers. So what a wonderful way for us to go in work with the RCPI, become trained as trainers for those who are interested in doing that, and then going to the neighborhood associations. These are people that we normally would not have contact with. They may not ever have had someone in their family on supervision. And so here's the information from the RCPI. But also, I'm a probation officer. This is what we do. These are the kinds mm -hmm. of things towards right, the end. Right. So it, it, uh, it kind of gets the information out, and it's to let the, the people in the neighborhood know what does it mean to me when the president says we're on alert? What what does that mean, and what should I be vigilant? What does that mean to me? Yeah, and so once that's what again, the it's about. just it's tremendous information sharing, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, you're learning so much about the different uh, about the different communities, and it just it reminds me of a definition of effective communication that a fellow by the name of Larry uh, Liberty ad advanced. Um, and in it, he talked about uh, communication not just simply being listening or speaking, but trying to understand the perspective of the, the other individual. Put yourself in their place when you, uh, mm -hmm. when you do communicate. And as such, it takes uh, courage mm -hmm. to do so. And all, every one of these programs we're talking about, in fact, uh, it takes, takes courage. Right. So um, thank you. Let's move on now to our next segment. One of the major objectives in implementing public information and outreach programs is that it will prevent crime. Listen to how some chiefs describe programs that are doing just this. It's important uh, to help young people to make better uh, choices uh, uh, in life. Uh, also, we're educating them about our role. The Partners in Education program, we're uh, involved in their uh, career program. And uh, usually uh, when we uh, speak to, um, uh, you know, the students, we explain to them our role in the uh, federal system. Uh, they, uh, we talk about the knowledge and skills uh, that are needed to, uh, to be successful uh, in the workforce. The activities can range from uh, mentoring students, uh, tutoring students, uh, and uh, 
also serving as guest uh, lecturers uh, to uh, the uh, students in their uh, respective schools. The, um, the program is really the brainchild of one of our district court judges, Judge uh, Sedwick. He decided to, um, to have a mock trial and he solicited the uh, cooperation from um, the U.S. Attorney, the Federal Public Defender, uh, the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and our office and others in the court family um, and challenged us to put together a program and we were able to get about uh, the task of, of putting together the mock trial. And it was felt that it would be a good idea if in some way we could connect the staff with the community in a different way than their official capacity. To make that connection, the probation officers of Illinois Northern sought out low-income Chicago neighborhoods like these, home territory to much of their clientele. As challenging as conditions are here for adults, they're even more difficult for children. It's been an arrangement from which everyone benefited and everyone learned. Officers, students, even the school. Tutoring the kids was a, it was a learning experience for me. Um, I didn't realize that uh, there were so many kids in need of uh, some assistance. It showed to them that there are people who do care, <clears throat> even on the law enforcement side. Many of the officers were surprised at the depth of the bonds that formed. As the relationship grew, they organized holiday parties for the students and field trips to the courthouse where they could meet African-American role models from the judiciary. We owe those kids, the community, and ourselves the best work that we can do so that we then hopefully won't be seeing them later on. Our staff wants to do this, and I think our system, the probation system, attracts a lot of people that take this job or come to this job because they want to make a difference. And I think in our office, our mission is to try to help people change and protect the community if people don't change. Either way it goes, we make a difference. Yes, we do make a difference, and those are two very impactful programs that we just saw. Uh, Elaine, we mentioned earlier that you collaborated with the Regional Community Policing Institute in Florida to produce a CD that teaches young children about the legal consequences of drug involvement. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, good. This is my time for my uh, advertisement <laughs> for FedFacts, the real deal. Um, we had started by doing a lot of drug education, and I think that's being done all over uh, in many, many districts across the country, because of the, the concern that the, if the drug laws and the sentencing guidelines are so strict with respect to drug trafficking and drug involvement, um, as a deterrence, that that's the purpose of it, then it's, doesn't, it's not helpful if the first time that somebody hears about that is when they have the, uh, the deer in the headlights look as they're standing before a, a federal district court judge being sentenced. So we wanted to get the word out ab about um, the, how risky it was, not only to use drugs, not only to deal drugs, but to really be involved and around people that do those high risk, risk activities. Um, so we started with, we've been doing it for a decade with paper and pencil and chalkboards in schools and wanted to, to really uh, uh, step it up a bit and make it more contemporary. Uh, we went to Haida first, uh, the High Impact Drug Trafficking Area Committee, and locally they loved it. They said, this is a great idea, we'll, we'll be willing to give you money to start to do this. And then nationally said, well, really, we're focusing more on interdiction, not on, on da da da, we, we didn't get the money. The following year, we went to the RCPI the Regional Community Policing mm -hmm. Institute. And they said, if we get funding, we'll do that program. And it was a wonderful partnership because um, our staff had all of the expertise. They wrote the curriculum. It was a curriculum they were very familiar with. And then they started to do it. Uh, but the RCPI really had some technical uh, knowledge. They had done this kind of thing before. So you each brought different skills different to the table. Different skills to yeah. the table. And <clears throat> what we did was we wrote five scenarios, and our staff wrote the scenarios. Like he said this, she said no, she would never say that. And <laughs> each scenario it was really a lot of fun to watch the process. But each scenario involved a different aspect of 
of the law with respect to drugs. So one scenario, for example, teaches conspiracy and what a conspiracy is. Another one focuses on the uh, enhanced penalties and guideline issues and ma min mandatory minimums um, surrounding trafficking at, at schools specifically. One involves um, just the dangers of ecstasy and GHB, some of the club drugs, yeah. because kids had a lot of misconceptions about club drugs. We'd get a lot of questions. Well, that's not really a drug. Well, yes, it is. Um, and even in some situations, uh, each scenario has very culpable, uh, clearly culpable defendants in it, and some who are not so culpable. So we start with the crime. And then it goes on, and there is the law. And we explain what the law is. Then there's a, the jury, and the jury is a peer group of kids looking at the scenarios, talking about them, and responding to them. And then we have uh, the conviction, and it, you, you kind of go over each of the players in the scenario, and it says what they were convicted of. And finally, we have the real deal. And the real deal is the judge explaining the law as it relates to that specific scenario. The kids love it because it's like watching TV. It's very fast-paced. It's very contemporary. It's got a lot of music. The presenters like it because it's easy to present. Um, you, even people who are not comfortable getting up in front of a group can use the CD to present to a group, or they can use it as a standalone in a classroom. And because we did it through the RCPI rather than independently, it's free to all of the schools and community groups across the state of Florida and through the RCPIs mm -hmm. to other areas in the country as well. So, so far now, it's gone to all the probation offices in the country and pretrial offices, so your chief should have a copy um, if, you're, if you want to, to begin a program. Um, it also went to all the U.S. Attorney's offices through their Safe Streets programs, and the, it was uh, featured at the RCPI National Conference and recently at a conference uh, for women legislatures held in California, actually, um, at the, with, I believe, 700 women legislators from throughout the, the country. So it's really, it's, it's really been well accepted. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, too, it's not just lecturing at somebody, but it, it shows that it's, it's being discussed by, by the, the jury of peers, if you will, and... Uh, so it is such a valuable. Uh, well, the idea was piece. not to 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 necessarily frighten kids into if you do this, this is going to happen, uh, but really to give them information, accurate information that they can then use to make better choices. And that's kind of the way that we that that we go into the schools. We're not here just to scare you, to frighten you. We want to give you information that you can use in making decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, in the process, we spend time talking about. We're probation officers, and this is what we, this is what we do. And look, can I tell you about other careers within the criminal justice um, profession? So, it, 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 and the kids ask a lot of questions. This year alone, our staff reached directly 3,000 kids, wow. um, and that's directly. In addition, we presented because we can't. We're getting, you know. You can't get out there that much. We do have our core work to do as well. So we started to train the student resource officers, who are the police in this, the community-based police that are in the schools, on the CD and on federal law, because they really are are uh, not up on. Oh no, this prison of a felony. That's not an offense. Well, it may not be an offense on the state. It is an offense in federal. So we had to train them and the teachers so that they can take it back and reach even more kids. Yeah, what a wonderful program. And again, available. To everybody. Uh, it's available to everybody, and uh, it's already gone out to uh, uh, copy to each of the districts in the country. I've never sat at a table with the author of a bestseller, have no, you? No, it's our staff. <laughs> our staff. You had yeah, to see this committee. Give the staff credit, right? They were yeah. tremendous. They yeah. did such an outstanding job. Yeah. Of, and a great uh, example, again, of cooperation, yeah. a partnership with uh, with another agency that uh, you brought different skills to the table and produced such a wonderful product. Yeah. Uh, Joe, can you give me another example? That really is impressive. Yeah. Uh, going back to that uh, program, the SACSI, the Strategic uh, Approaches to Community Safety, uh, again, the goal is to advise uh, young adults who are high risk uh, to, to stop their criminal conduct. You know, and it's hard to measure whether that's a successful program or not. The point is this collaborative group, they're together, they're making the effort to to tell the individuals, if you use a gun in a crime, you're going to do long federal time. Right. And, and that's the message they're trying to get across to the individuals. And, and it's just a, a sense of awareness that's being made by this group. And, uh, you know, the, the goal is that uh, the message will get across to these individuals. And, uh, 
that they will turn their lives around. Uh, and and they, the collaborative, collaborative group offers uh, individuals in, from their community who will help them turn their life around. And, right. uh, and hopefully the violence will stop. But it's also uh, an indication from this group, from the community, that they're sick and tired of, of burying their dead. And, and uh, so that's the point they're getting across. And, and right. you know, they're hoping that this will prevent violence in the long run. Right. George, any advice to chiefs about developing uh, outreach programs for the public? Well, Bob, I, I think it's very important that uh, uh, agencies out there, chiefs out there, understand that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think as the result of, of the research done for this program and, and what's probably going to pour in after it's done, we'll have a whole onslaught of, of uh, models out there to follow where chiefs who are currently not necessarily doing anything for community outreach or public information can kind of pick and choose and then adapt it you know to their own local community and that but I also know there are just a whole host of agencies out there who have been doing wonderful programs and of course you know Elaine's is, is just fantastic I know there are others out there uh, and things such as uh, uh, chiefs who support their officers going out and, and doing community service, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just, just, you know, whatever they feel is, is a good place for them to go. Uh, and so that kind of support is very important because that's, kind of, again, kind of the passive but active kind of thing where, you know, you're not doing anything necessarily that, that is directly related to probation and pretrial, but you might be out there helping a, a homeless shelter or something else to do its job. And in the mm -hmm. process, you're saying, well, I'm, you know, uh, Joe Smith, probation officer with the, the federal yeah. courts, and, and that's very important kind of outreach, too. Right, getting the word out again. Uh, uh, thanks, George. In one of our video clips, Josh Wine from Alaska described a mock trial that his district, in concert with other criminal justice agencies, put on for students. Another district has been inviting students to observe actual sentencing of young offenders who've been convicted of a drug offense. We have on the phone Mark Piskalich, a probation officer from the District of Montana, to tell us about this program. Mark, give us a brief description of your program and the impact uh, it's having on the students who are involved. Bob, the program uh, was developed after the District of Montana came into a, a meth methamphetamine conspiracy case that involved about 13 fairly young individuals between ages 18 and 23, and uh, Chief Judge Malloy uh, wanted to share with the, with the state's youth exactly what happens in a, in, to people who get involved in this. So what we did was um, do a little bit of education at the schools prior to sentencing and then ultimately uh, cycled high school students through uh, the courtroom during a day where we had seven of, the, of these offenders being sentenced. And uh, they actually came in, sat, witnessed the sentencing, and then uh, there was a presentation by the U.S. Attorney and by the Chief Federal Defender of the District uh, kind of explaining their roles. And the judge even asked the uh, offenders if they had anything they would like to say to the students. And, and most of the offenders uh, had some pretty spontaneous and fairly poignant things to say about uh, uh, the results of their actions and the ramifications of their actions. Uh, it became the Montana Project, and we've since uh, done it in other communities in Montana and Missoula and also in Billings, um, and it, it, it has a very powerful impact. We've gotten great feedback from the kids and the teachers. Uh, it's specific to what we did in Helena. A lot of the kids knew these people being sentenced, and so it was, it was very powerful to see uh, what happens when you get involved in the federal, sentence, or federal system. Thanks, Mark. Tell me, did the defendants know that they were going to be called upon to actually have some words to say to their, uh, their fellow students, if you will? You know, they didn't, and that was one of the things that uh, really made it powerful. But most of the defendants weren't aware that there were going to be students in the, in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could see that in their faces when they walked in, and there were 50 or so high school students sitting in the, the courtroom, some of whom they recognized. And then the judge asked them if they had something to say. And uh, in, invariably, they, they said, you know, don't make these mistakes. This is, this is not a road to travel. Uh, and so it was, it was very powerful, and, it was, and it's something we're continuing hoping to expand on to uh, include other, you know, younger, younger kids at, at various levels, maybe not watching a, an actual sentencing, but exposing them to the court and what happens here. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Very impactful. Uh, 
We have another call waiting. Rich Crawford, uh, North Dakota's uh, uh, North Dakota's district recently participated in an outreach program called Share the Fame. Uh, Rich, give us a brief description of your program and how it's impacted the students who were involved. Uh, Rich, are you on the line? One more time, Rich. Are you on the line? To I am on the line. Great. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Go, go ahead and describe the program. Okay. Thank you. The Share the Fame Project, uh, our program, came about as a result of our effort to increase uh, community outreach programs in our Indian communities. Uh, the North, state of North Dakota has four reservation communities, and the Native American population constitutes about 50% of our supervision caseload. Um, about two years ago, Renee Green and Ron Dyson from uh, Office of Probation Pretrial Services and Jim Eglin from the uh, FJC Research uh, Division came to our district and uh, worked with us on ways to improve and to plan for better services in our Indian community. Uh, Renee went back uh, and coincidentally met a gentleman by the name of Patrick Byers, who is a performing arts instructor from LaGuardia High School in New York City. And together they talked about the possibility of using the arts as a way to connect with uh, some students in the Native American communities in North Dakota. And so we begin planning uh, this effort in October, on October 6th through 13th of the past year. Uh, Patrick and Renee, along with my staff and along with the four reservation communities and several people, including schools and uh, elders and others, undertook to uh, start this project. The project involved um, uh, the juveniles from the reservations, and we had about 300 participants overall, uh, auditioning and performing in their native, uh, in their native dance and their native song, and as well as doing artistic uh, things, including drawing and listening to uh, uh, educators, um, and then doing poetry. And uh, the the week culminated with some of those kids being selected to go to Bismarck, North Dakota and uh, then being subsequently selected to participate in a project with the LaGuardia High School students that will come to North Dakota and then also will go to New York uh, during the coming year. And they will actually do a full performance of music that's choreograph choreographed by uh, LaGuardia and will also involve uh, intermingling the two cultures uh, and the music of the cultures. So... Um, in all, it was a tremendously successful outreach effort. Uh, we had the media present. Our officers did a lot of public appearances to talk about federal probation and about crime issues in the reservations. And uh, we intend on following through with this with two more phases, which we should have done by sometime in October. The students must have really appreciated that, uh, needless to say. Yeah, we have had just tremendous uh, feedback uh, from the communities, the press, uh, the, the schools. The activities are still ongoing with radio talk shows between the kids from North Dakota and New York. So they've been very exciting for our staff. Yeah, and again, they see you in a totally different light. Yeah. Totally different light. Yep, we're involved in the front end instead of just in the back end. That's great. Well, that's terrific. And again, thank you, uh, Rich, for joining us. And let's now turn to our final segment. Let's go back to our community outreach model. We've discussed getting the word out about probation and pretrial services to the criminal justice family, the service providers, and the public. We also learned how many programs are geared toward crime prevention. Considering the time commitment that is required, why would districts initiate a public information and community outreach program? As you'll hear in the next segment, despite the challenges, being part of an outreach program is important because it all comes back to you. I, I think that uh, some of the problems that need to be overcome uh, in developing an effective public outreach program deals with the fact that for years, I think we were content to just kind of sit back and, and do our own thing. We get so wrapped up in our uh, supervision and our pre-sentence writing and our pretrial work, and it is so important um, to reach out uh, to the community. It's so important, I think, uh, for 
other agencies and groups in the community and the public at large to understand that the federal court is a service agency uh, as well as an enforcing agency. I think it's incredibly important that the judiciary convey to the public and all of its users, either direct users or indirect users, what its statutory mission and functions are. I think human resources, the availability of resources, is the largest obstacle. In doing public outreach, there are a number of, of obstacles. Um, I think the first is, is connecting with the public, deciding um, who you would like to reach out to because there are a number of publics, a number of constituencies. I think it's important as we, uh, as stewards of taxpayer funds, um, I think we need to more, move toward more results-oriented uh, supervision and management. And I think that one of the ways that we can uh, do that is through better public outreach. We have made a connection to the community and anytime you make a connection to the community uh, you develop uh, additional resources that are helpful in uh, carrying out our uh, duties and responsibilities. Also it promotes teamwork in the office uh, because you get everyone involved in uh, and uh, trying to reach the goals uh, um, and objectives uh, of the program. Just that sense of giving, that sense of accomplishment uh, makes our officers feel uh, very good. As you just heard, public information and outreach initiatives help the public understand what we do, help us move towards result-oriented supervision of offenders and defendants, help us develop more resources and promote teamwork among our officers. And, as Julian Dew said, they just make officers feel very good. Uh, George, what benefits do you believe districts will experience when they become involved in public information and outreach programs? Well, Bob, I think we've already mentioned a number of those, but you know, one of the direct benefits that, that can be seen is uh, our partnerships and new relationships with the community and especially in this era of shrinking budgets and less money available for services for defendants and offenders uh, we can better tie into the community and the community-based services we can take advantage of low cost or no cost programs we can hook people up uh, and we can get a lot of support from the community and we we can educate them we can uh, help them to understand better our mission and we achieve more success from that so uh, there's also self-satisfaction in doing these kinds of things, getting out, reaching out, uh, doing the prevention kinds of things that probation and pretrial both can do uh, if we just take the effort to do that. So the staff can feel good about it, uh, I as a chief can feel good about it, and the judges will feel good about that because we're going to let them know that we're doing these things and how effective we are at doing them and successful. Right. Thanks, George. Uh, Joe, if I were an officer and I wanted to launch uh, an outreach program, how should I begin? Well, Bob, the chiefs have agreed, again, on a national basis that this is a, a goal that we should pursue. So the chief is probably familiar with uh, this opportunity that, that this, this uh, uh, does exist. If, if you, uh, uh, let me give you a, uh, some advice, officer. Uh, maybe you should <laughs> check with your supervisor, uh, do some research, find out what the needs are. Um, uh, after you get your supervisor to agree or your deputy or your chief to agree to get involved in this, um, determine what the needs are in the organization. You don't have to reinvent the wheel as George indicated. Um, check with the, your regional administrator. There's neighboring districts more than likely that are involved in public outreach already uh, and that RA can give you some insight. Uh, check with the FJC, Michael Siegel, LDP, the, the Leadership Development Program. He has a list of projects, and I'm sure many projects involve public outreach. And that's a great resource that, that is at our fingertips. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And uh, start easy. Having a quick success is nice. And, and, and get other people in your staff involved. This is not an officer-only driven uh, project or program. Uh, we have a support staff and automation staff involved in our uh, uh, public outreach programs. So uh, again, uh, that would be my advice to an officer trying to figure out how they could get started. Yeah, there's a lot of information uh, out there and we've just kind of uh, scratched the surface. We've heard about uh, some of these programs. Uh, Elaine, any cautions for districts in, in selecting the right program? 
Well, I think that the the one big issue is is that it can be time consuming. So that if you're going to select a project, so select one that has sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that one's that's pretty important. And another thing is to make sure that it is meaningful for the community that you're that you're trying to reach. Um, so that it should be one that has that has meaning that that reaches what you your goals, what you want to to do, and what what you want to accomplish. And it doesn't hurt to have some passion behind it. Make sure it's something the officers buy into and really do feel excited about, um, because part of the benefit is the re-energized feeling that you get when you go out and you do something that you know is really worthwhile. Um, and you're doing something good, and it takes you out of your your day-to-day -day mainstream work, and, uh, and and it is re-energizing. So I think that tho those are the the cautions: is make sure that it's not too time-consuming, uh, that it has enough uh, staff backing so that it doesn't end up being a burden on just a few, um, and that it's meaningful. Yeah, sustainability and mm -hmm. choosing the right program is important because you you really can't do everything. So choosing the one that best meets the needs of, of the people that you serve and, uh, and has that passion, if you yeah, will, to get good. those champions on board mm -hmm. is so, is and so they, important. And they can take a life on their own, too. And you, you don't, the chief doesn't want to force this down an officer's throat. But, and, and Elaine hit the nail on the head. You let the staff generate the ideas. And then uh, the staff have ownership and buy-in. And before you know it, the program is on its way. And then there's other creative thinking going on concerning other programs. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, in a recent memo, John Hughes, AO Assistant Director for the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services, announced the launching of public information and outreach as a new initiative of the Probation and Pretrial Services system. David Leathery spoke with John earlier about the importance of districts implementing outreach program. Let's listen to what he has to say. Hi, John. Thank you so much for coming to join us here in the studio. Could you tell us why public information on outreach is so important to probation and pretrial services? It's very important, uh, really, for two reasons. First of all, probation and pretrial services work is so important to the proper operation of the court, but hardly anybody knows that. We only get attention when something goes wrong. So we really need to reach out and, and explain who we are and what we're trying to do absent the crisis. The second thing is uh, there's an old adage, uh, the best time to make friends is before you need them. And it would be a good idea if uh, officers knew who was in their community, the, not just the law enforcement types, but the community leaders, the school officials, guidance counselors. Uh, there should be some kind of relationship so that when you need to pick up the phone and, and ask for help, there's already yeah. some some understanding mm -hmm. about why you're doing that and so forth. So they shouldn't wait until they, they need a friend to make yeah, one. That's a very important really. point, yeah. What are some of the payoffs that you see for probation and pretrial services in, in this process by reaching out? On a very practical level, the, the first payoff would be it's easier to get things done. When you do have a, a name and a phone mm -hmm. number on your, on your desk right, written on your blotter, you know who, who to call mm -hmm. right away. Uh, it's a lot better than starting with the, the yellow pages or the white pages and the blue pages. Uh, so on that level, it's very practical. An officer is much more effective if he or she has a lot of contacts out in the community and can pick up the phone and ask for favor, that sort of thing. Another payoff, perhaps more important, is, uh, is that outreach programs, especially those aimed at middle school and high school students, can have the effect of deterring at least some of those kids who might have been on the edge from getting themselves into drugs or, or other crime. So it's quite a payoff. And you may never know that, that you've had that influence, but you probably did. John, where can districts go for assistance? I would start with the people you've seen in this broadcast, but I welcome calls at the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services here at the AO. We've made this a major initiative for FY 2003. I've asked Nancy Beatty to head this up and to uh, make sure that good things happen this year. We want to give this a high priority. Uh, she can be reached at 202-502-1649. And she'd be glad to point you in the right direction. So please feel free to, 
give Nancy Beattie a call. Uh, word of mouth is a, is a big uh, way to do this, too. If you hear of somebody that does a good job at this, call them up and ask them. Just get started. I mean, uh, that, that's the whole secret to this. Start small. Uh, go to your, your, your child's school. I'm planning to do that myself in a few weeks with the FedFax program. I mean, start there, and, you know, you have good intentions. Good things will happen, so just get going. Why has this been such an important initiative for you? I think it, it's important uh, on two levels. Um, we, need, we are a very good program. We should be very proud of ourselves. We're, we're very quiet about it. We don't toot our own horn very often, but we need to from time to time. And this, this effort will give us some structure. It will remind us that that's an important part of the job to uh, describe to the community, to Congress, to, to the court even, our own courts, uh, about the important work we do. But also we can make a difference. We can uh, actually deter somebody from a life of crime perhaps or, or you know, through FedFax or some other program, actually diverting them away from the system. So very important work. Very important, I agree. And thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to come join us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. As John said, we're a good system. We should be proud of the work we do. And indeed, we can make a difference. We're almost finished for today, but I want to ask one more question. Elaine, speak for all of us. What's the bottom line to keep in mind when developing an outreach program? Well, just do it. I, that's one of the things. Get, overcome the reticence and just do it. Uh, community outreach really does complement our core work. We know we're valuable. Well, we're not always perceived as being valuable. And I think that it is an important time, this is really an important time, for us to, to get the word out um, about the incredible work that, that our staff does across the country. Good words to remember. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks also to our other panelists today, Joe Giacobbe and George Walker. And thank you to our call-in participants for being so willing to share their experiences. Jennifer Sunshine, Mark Piskulich, and Rich Crawford. Today we've taken a look at public information and outreach programs that districts have implemented in getting the word out to the criminal justice family, service providers, and the public. We've examined some of the challenges and practices proven to be effective for our panelists and call-in participants. Also, we've explored how community outreach can play a role in crime prevention. We hope you find the information in this broadcast useful. Let me remind you to please complete an evaluation that was part of your downloadable materials on the DCN. We appreciate your feedback. Also, we invite you to access the Court Operations Exchange on the FJC homepage. There you'll find information that districts have posted and are sharing with colleagues throughout the federal court system. What a great resource. Finally, I'd like to thank David Sellers of the Public Affairs Office and John Hughes from the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services for partnering with us in this effort. Keep an eye on the FJTN Bulletin for other upcoming programs of interest to all court staff. Thank you for joining us today.